What's up everybody, and welcome back to the series. I'm Calvin McClure. After a three-month-long journey totaling some 140 million miles, the first ever spacecraft to reach the red planet had arrived on time and on course, and for the first time in many weeks, its systems would be powered back on for the close encounter for which it had been destined. Though many had studied the planet's features and patterns in the sky from afar many times before, never had any of its secrets and mysteries been observed from so close a distance. Though limited in capacity, Mars 2 sensors would provide the most unprecedented view of Earth's nearest neighbor away from the Sun that anyone had ever seen. And yet, almost as quickly as it had arrived, did the spacecraft begin its departure from what had been its long-awaited destination. Its mission now already completed, Mars 2 would continue its journey into the ether of the cosmos all alone, its journey come to an end. Arriving on the heels of Mars 2, all but about a week's time separating the two spacecraft, MRSS had arrived and, if successful, would become the first ever spacecraft to enter into Martian orbit. With controllers in high spirits after the success of Mars 2, one could even say an air of overconfidence loomed inside mission control. But while some were eager, others were concerned, and rightly so. When MRSS had launched the heaviest object ever to be hurled beyond Earth's gravitational pull, it had stretched even the mighty Atlas Aurora to its limits. Early calculations indicated that the probe might be arriving at the Red Planet with too steep an approach and too great a speed. Beyond sending the probe into the upper atmosphere ever so much, very little more could be done at this point. As the engines fired, consuming the limited fuel on board, telemetry streamed back down to Earth. Engineers knew what the capture burn duration time was supposed to be and frantically looked at the data they'd received to try and find the matching number, indicating that the engines had shut down on time. But when the telemetry showed the actual time, they knew something had gone terribly wrong. That number equaled very close to the burn duration of the total fuel capacity on board the spacecraft, fuel that was destined for use in capture and subsequent maneuvers. Later analysis would confirm the worst, that MRSS had come and gone when it was meant to stay. Now, the doomed mission of MRSS was left with little more than drift aimlessly into the cosmos until all contact with the probe was lost.
not more than a week after MRSS's failed attempt at entering Martian orbit. Mars 1, sister ship to Mars 2, identical in every way save the path it would follow over the red planet, had now itself arrived. With the lessons learned in just the previous few days, Mars 1 would dip down into the upper layers of the Martian atmosphere in an attempt to squeeze out the little more data that could be gained from such a maneuver, both for scientific gains as well as for future reference. The soft, almost indiscernible drone of the atmosphere, as it rushed over the probe, interfering with its sensitive instruments, was heard back home, the noise in the signal having been extracted from the telemetry. And just as its sister ship Mars 2 had done before, Mars 1 would come and go in what seemed to be but a moment's time. As the distance from home grew greater, its signal would grow fainter, and Mars 1 would one day come to be remembered only by those who had made her. On a cold evening at the Cape, cool winds shimmered as Atlas sat poised quietly on the pad. Night would pass, and the dawn would be awakened to the all-familiar sounds of Atlas as it reached for the stars yet again. Mission planners feel that the destination, a small moon-sized body, yet one of the largest in the asteroid belt, was out of reach for current communications capabilities. But with budgets available and spare parts not lacking, the temptations of the launch window had pushed them into action. As Atlas roared on, mission planners watched and waited in a rather calm and collected manner to see if all would move according to plan. Yet ever before had the probe reached orbit around the Earth, did the mission go all too terribly wrong. It was Centaur, not any part of the Vesta spacecraft, that would prove to be the mission's ultimate undoing. One of its twin RL-10 engines, which had proven to be so reliable in missions past, had encountered a rare critical failure and shut down, sending Centaur into an unrecoverable spin. The one silver lining was that when the next available window arrived, the technology would be ready.
As fate would have it, the agency would suffer yet another blow to its newest of endeavors. As crews, mission planners, and engineers alike back home will work at a feverish pace to complete the many tasks needed to reach the moon. Others worked on building the necessary infrastructure that was itself moving along at a feverish pace. In what was supposed to have been the first of a four-craft mini-constellation of communication satellites, each placed at different orbits around the moon, the Agena failed to fire its engine for the burn to the moon. Now stranded in lower Earth orbit, the small satellite would instead serve as a technological demonstrator, allowing engineers to test and further fine-tune the subroutines and onboard systems for the remaining satellites. While bothersome, the loss of just one out of four satellites was deemed to be only a minor setback. A four-ship formation had been selected for the express reason of having redundancy built in, should one satellite be lost. What did weigh on the minds of those on the ground was that of all the satellites to lose, starting with the first, did not help instill the level of confidence desired. With satellite number one now safely into Earth orbit, the attention shifted to the remaining three satellites to ensure their fate would not be the same. When the engineers responsible for the Agena back at the Cuglas Aircraft Company had confirmed to the agency that the issue that had plagued the previous mission had been identified and resolved, launches of the remaining three lunar communication satellites resumed. This time, both the Atlas and the Agena would once again rise to the task at hand, and after a short hiatus around the Earth, the first of the satellites was sent on its way to the moon. The short distance separating the two bodies would prove uneventful in every respect, and after a mere five-day journey, the last remaining critical step in the mission could begin. The network of satellites, it was hoped, would help provide much desired coverage over blackout regions when the moon sits in between Earth and spacecraft, something mission control was already far too aware of with the two Gemini missions it had previously sent to the moon. While one satellite performed its transit to the moon, the next one in line made its way to the launch pad, and in the few days that would pass in between, the moon's position relative to the Earth would change ever so slightly, allowing the next satellite's position around the moon to be attained. Luna 2, or the Lunar Communication Satellite for Apollo Applications, was placed in its designated highly elliptical lunar orbit, the first of the three that would do so. As the planes of the Earth and Moon aligned best they could for a trip to the Moon, 
the next satellite launch from the Cape, onwards and upwards to Earth's nearest neighbor. As had done the previous satellites, as one transited to its place around the moon, the next moved slowly yet surely to the pad for its turn to be sent moonbound. Luna 3, just as Luna 2 had mere days before, would be placed in an eccentric lunar orbit so as to maximize loiter time over the moon's far side. The fourth and final of the lunar communication satellites launched to the all-familiar tune of the Atlas soaring through the night sky above the Cape. The last of the lunar lunar communication satellites would join the other two finding its own place in its pre-designated orbit around the moon. And the combination of the three would act as a sort of tag team whereby one satellite could bounce its signal to another, relaying the whole back down to Earth. In so doing, the network would help ensure that as crews who would fly around the moon and work upon its surface, no region would be hidden or off limits to ground crews back home. The Luna Communications Network, small as it may be, would play its part in the grander scheme and help ensure the success of the Apollo Moon program. For now, with all three satellites in place, a small team of engineers would begin running a series of tests to ensure the robustness of the system and its performance were as expected. With the Luna network now complete, one more piece in the giant technological puzzle that was Apollo was in place, and the entire program was one step closer, small as it was, to boots on the moon's surface. After several successful missions to the lunar surface in the Intrepid missions, and even a couple of successful sample return missions, NASA engineers and planetary scientists started having a pretty solid understanding of what to expect when landing a spacecraft on the moon. The sample's return had been invaluable, providing at least some idea of how fine, how gritty and rough lunar dust could be. As for the Intrepid missions, topsoil hardness, localized topography for possible landing sites were just the tip of the iceberg. Yet, even after all of this, one thing was still a great mystery despite all that had been learned thus far, and that was how easy or difficult it was to actually move about the lunar surface. Other questions remained unanswered equally. Did the soil hardness vary much from one region to another? Did the roughness of the dust change? What about boulder size variations or local topographical changes? 
Enter Karen Bourne. Derived from the Latin for wheel, Karen 1 was the first probe designed to do far more than simply study the immediate acidity of its landing site. It was hoped that Karen 1 would help stave off fears of the unknown about the risks of the lunar surface for crews, and that by doing so, bolder and more daring exploration objectives could be planned out for even the earliest of missions. To maximize its chances of success, the landing site had been kept to a rather general area instead of a specific target landing site. But the target was in the northern regions of the moon where, it was hoped, the harsher landscape would provide better feedback. But with all of the weight on its shoulders, as so much was expected of the mission, the tiniest of errors in the fuel load calculations that had crept in unnoticed during the design stages would ultimately lead to the mission's demise. Karim-1, the first wheeled robotic lander sent to any celestial body, would never soft land on the moon. From home, all that could be discerned from the telemetry was a sudden and abrupt drop in data not at all which should have been sent back had a successful landing occurred. Though tens of thousands of miles away, the impact was felt by all back home. On a sunny morning out on the central Californian coast, the usually quiet landscape surrounding the Vandenberg launch site was abruptly disturbed by what was to become an all too familiar sound, that of the United States Air Force operated Titan III rocket. The payload being carried aloft the three-stage rocket was the first of what was to become an all new state-of-the-art telecommunications network to be established in medium Earth orbit. For by now, the old Anik communication satellites that had been launched early in the space program's history had become either dysfunctional or totally obsolete, if anything remained at all. With the ever fast approaching manned missions to the moon set to begin in the very near future, the need to replace the existing and deprecated satellite communications network loomed large over the agency's head, as did the need for a robust telecommunications network that could maintain current and future USAF operational needs. With budget constraints and timeline difficulties ever present, both agencies would partner together to form a new alliance, the United Interagency Space Communications Organization. The new satellites, utilizing the most recent developments in electrical semiconductors and materials, were capable of bandwidths, data rates, and signal encryption that could meet both parties' respective priorities.
it was agreed upon that during high-profile missions, such as flights to the moon, precedence would be given over to the agency. Otherwise, precedence would be given over to the USAF for national security purposes. But one thing was clear. Both parties would work together in intimate cooperation towards the common goal of reaching the moon. As far as infrastructure was concerned, NASA would help foot the bill and aid in flight readiness operations, while USAF would take care of the satellite design and commissioning and provide the launch vehicles. Both parties would share continuous on-orbit operations management. In total, 12 satellites were planned to be positioned in three rings, comprising four satellites each, and each separated by 120 degrees. With so many planned launches ahead, the now relatively quiet hills surrounding Vandenberg were about to become quite a noisy place indeed.
with only two remaining satellites left and ready to be launched. The agency's focus now shifted to a more pressing matter. But for now, the new communications network was more than ready to begin its shakedown test. S1B first stage fuel tank is pressurized and the, the second uh, stage liquid oxygen tank pressurizing at this Not time. As much uh, reports now on the uh, communication circuits as everybody stands by monitoring the various consoles and watching the various to ensure everything is okay. T minus one hour, one minute, 43 seconds and counting. We are still proceeding. Although not the first nor even the second time in its history did the Saturn 1B make rocket enthusiasts as well as the ground beneath it feel the thunderous sound emanating from its 9H1 engines, the launch of Apollo 1 would go down in history as the first flight of the spacecraft capsule that would become the main workhorse for missions that would take Kerbals to the lunar surface and beyond. This test flight the last remaining one planned with crew on board was a critical milestone years in the making and years behind schedule. The all-veteran crew of three, Mitchell, Ford, and Brewer, all part of the original selection of astronauts stemming from the earliest days of the space program, had been selected to fly the mission. It was their seasoned perspective and feedback that engineers were so eager to get at missions end. But early on in the mission, that experience would become important earlier than anticipated as one of the four onboard engines shut down prematurely in the flight. As the climb onto orbit continued and all seemed to be well, an unusual thud was heard in the cabin as warning lights on the instrument panel illuminated when the port site panel cover on the service module was torn off unexpectedly due to aerodynamic stresses. But in all of this, None of these issues were mission stoppers, and the crew and mission pressed on. The remaining sequence would prove uneventful, and Apollo 1 would reach orbit and begin its 10-day duration shakedown mission. When compared to the tiny Mercury capsule they had all flown in previously, the massive Apollo command module was enormous. When all of the life support systems, communications, and navigation systems 
had been shown themselves worthy and ready. The service propulsion system was put through its paces to test out and prove out its ability to light and relight multiple times while in orbit, a feature that would be invaluable in future missions. On the tenth day, when the mission timer had reached its mark at mission's end, Brewer flipped three switches on the control panel inside the command module, and the lifelink that connected the two parts of the command and service module combination, providing both crew and systems with vital electrical power, was severed. Brewer, Ford, and Mitchell would enjoy one of the smoothest and roomiest reentries any of them had ever experienced before. And the success of Apollo 1 would now only further increase and stir everyone's resolve and excitement as the moon now seemed closer than ever before. At long last. Fading in the shadows of the much televised and publicized mission of Apollo 1, the launch of Apollo 2 fell practically by the wayside, as only but a few honorable mentions here and there of the mission made their way into a few news segments, but only in passing. But for those on the inside, the weight and gravitas of the mission of Apollo 2 was arguably every little bit as significant and important as had been that of Apollo 1. For sitting atop the mighty Saturn sat what was to become one of the most iconic and mystical spacecrafts the world had ever seen. In fact, when the payload fairing halves split apart, revealing what had been hidden inside, what emerged was arguably the strangest looking craft ever to soar into the blackness of space. The Lunar Excursion Module, or simply LEM for short, was the brainchild of one Grumman Aviation and Rocketry's Apollo Space Task Force, a ragtag group of engineers who'd been given the task of coming up with the design of the craft whose sole purpose would be to ferry crews to and from the lunar surface. 
though a spacecraft through and through, its odd, confusing, and bizarre appearance was due to the very nature of the mission with which it had been tasked to perform. For, you see, the lunar module would never during any mission breathe the air of Earth's atmosphere, but only experience the harshness of the vacuum of outer space. As such, every effort during its design process was aimed at one single objective, to minimize every possible ounce of weight so as to maximize the crew and the mission's chances of landing and returning from the lunar surface. A two-stage, two-seater design and powered by hypergolic fuels and battery power only, the danky-looking spacecraft had not a few tricks up its paper foil thin sleeves. During those precarious moments, making their way down to the lunar surface, cut off from all the relative safety, life support, and shelter of the command module, the lunar module would be the astronaut's home and only chance of ever coming back home. It would sustain them for food and shelter, provide accommodations and means of speaking with the orbiting command module and mission control back on Earth. But most importantly, having made it safely to the surface, the lunar module was their only chance of escaping it. But for now, the crewless mission of Apollo 2 had the sole opportunity to prove to everyone that the long-awaited lunar module was ready to leave the Earth moonbound for a landing. Having run through several engine firings and max performance oscillatory maneuvers designed to prove out the LEM's ability to maneuver while at full weight, the next key objective was testing the ascent stage's ability to detach itself and fly aloft on its own power. Back on the ground, Mission Control could see through the telemetry that the little ascent stage was both alive and free, and its engine, the power plant that simply could not ever be allowed to fail, was performing as expected. As it had done while still attached to the descent stage, the ascent stage went through its pre-programmed set of hard maneuvering and multiple engine relights, all to exert the maximum amount of stresses on the system to expose any remaining kinks in the design. Each firing burnt off more and more of the onboard fuel, and the firings of the ascent stage engine would continue until either the engine finally failed or the fuel reserves were totally depleted. Having been sent in a nearly geostationary transfer orbit, high above the Earth, the final testing performed was on the communication system. The small single antenna would be the crew's only means of communication back on Earth, once on the surface. It was another one of those systems that simply could not be afforded to fail at any single point in the mission. But as the flight went on, and testing continued, no kinks would arise and no chinks in the armor would be exposed. Finally, the last remaining technological hurdle that remained to be conquered before crews could be sent to the moon was complete. The next time crews would be sent up, it would be at last, to touch the moon.
That's going to do it for this episode. I really hope you enjoyed it. Please be sure to like and subscribe as it really does help the channel to grow. And let me know what your thoughts on the episode are and what you think of the series as a whole. If you'd like to support the channel in a special way, head on over to our Calvin McClure Patreon page. You'll find the link in the video description below. As always, a special thanks goes out to my patrons and a big thanks to everyone for your continued support. I'm Calvin McClure, and I'll see you next time.